Hello, welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 2, Episode 9, with a slightly different lineup this week. We've got myself and we've got Sam. Yep. Um, so as ever, guys, please leave a like. Also, uh, drop us a comment if there's anything you like that we discussed today. And uh, as ever, please subscribe. So this week, guys, we're going to get Sam to bring us up to speed with industry. And then we're actually going to be joined by the very talented Tom Lee Rudder, who's been on the podcast before. And uh, we're actually going to be discussing Westerns and what really defines Western as a genre. So without further ado, over to you, Sam, with industry. So this week, there's obviously been a lot more uh, pressing news, important news happening. Stuff stuff happening. So it's been very slow on uh, the industry news. But I found a few things. Um, Scott Derrickson is going to adapt the Black Phone by Joe Hill. Joe Hill is the guy who is Stephen King's son. So he's also a horror writer. Not many of his books have been successful going to film, unlike Stephen King. Maybe this is the one. My problem with uh, Scott Derrickson is that, like, I love Sinister, great film. Doctor Strange has its moments, but he's never done something, like, outstanding and people have this high expectation of him doing something great and... I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Another film which, again, is from a director who seems to get massive casts for whatever he wants, Rupert uh, Sanders. He's doing a Vietnam film called The Things They, They Carried. And it's got loads of young male actors in it. Tom Hardy's in it, Bill Skarsgård's in it, Ty Sheridan. And yeah, like I said, it's very slow news week. It's just a couple of castings, really. Um, And then Ty West, one of my favourite directors for horror. He hasn't done a film quite a good couple of years. And the last one we did was actually a Western. which uh, Ironically enough. (laughs) He's got a new horror film called X. And it's going to star Kid Cudi and Maya Goff. And A24 are going to be producing it. Don't know anything else. Plot's completely sealed. Under well. wraps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's going to be shooting the start of next year. And like I said, I love Ty West. And him working with A24 makes me think he's going to have a lot of room to be able to create. And uh, yeah, that's it. Because there's been much more pressing things. Good things have happened. Very good <laughs> things. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, on that, that note... Uh, thank you for industry, Sam. Obviously, it's a little bit lighter this week, so probably next week I'd imagine it'll start to pick up a little bit, well, a little bit again. Um, but yeah, so guys, this week we decided to change it up from our horror month, and um, we decided that we wanted to focus on westerns and really what defines a western and what gives it that unique sort of sense of um, well, a, well, a unique genre, I suppose. And um, we actually decided to bring in Tom Lee Rudder, who is also the director and writer of Day of the Stranger, which was really successful at Horror on Sea. And so, yeah, without further ado, hope you guys enjoy. So, everyone, we're joined by Tom Lee Rudder of Kearney Films. How you doing, Tom? Yeah, not too bad, guys. Thanks for having me back again. It's always fun. Thanks for joining us again. Um, So, yeah, this week... Um, we wanted to focus a bit more on westerns, and um, really, how I wanted to s- well start the discussion is what defines a western, what makes a good western, what are the key tropes within a western. Um, so for me, one of the major things that always stands out is the music. I think it's always oh yeah, the- I completely agree. Obviously, for me, that all solidifies in <clears throat> uh, the Italians did it with the spaghetti westerns because the you know, the scores that you'd see here in those, you know, the Morricone. Yeah. Yeah. They really added the poetry to a Western, more so than, you know, the classic Westerns that the Americans were showing. Now, <clears throat> it was definitely the poetry of the landscape, the sadness of it all. It was just all encapsulated in what Morricone did in these scores. Perfect. No, I completely agree. With, with his scores as well, there was a great use of, like, with, with empathy in regards to, you know, you felt all the emotions you were supposed to feel in those scenes. It, it felt... Absolutely gorgeous, yeah. Really so, moving. In fact, like in particular, um, my favourite, my personal favourite, is Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. And that score just brings me to tears every time. It's just, it's just stunning. <laughs> it's something else. It's those moments as well where, like, literally, if there was no music there, it's just people staring at each other. But that music drives <laughs> yeah. exactly how all those characters are feeling, and you're just like, "What's going to happen?" The tension it builds is perfect. The tension is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But it's all, it's all about. Um, it, well, one of my favourite driving factors of good cinema is atmosphere, and westerns are all about 
building an atmosphere and creating an atmosphere and soaking up that atmosphere. It's not necessarily about plot. It's just about, mm. you know, these characters darting around a landscape. And they're all building up atmosphere and building up tension. And they just end up having these long, drawn-out arcs, which end up being really quite uh, grandiose towards the end. And, you know, you they're, just, they're like kind of operas, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're kind of theatrical in a way. I think if you think about any great Western, they always have the long, drawn-out scenes that you know are building tension. Sometimes it's not even building tension. It could just be they're you know they're out in the landscape. And um, I've always find that with a Western, the pacing, even though it's a lot slower, you, you wouldn't see an action film um, in the same vein as like a Western. But you never feel like it's taken too long or oh, I just want to get on to the next scene and the music really, really exactly, yeah. reinforces that. It's letting the that. atmosphere breathe, it's letting the environment breathe, it's letting you soak up that environment and go back to Once Upon a Time in the West, that's what he's doing, he's just, he really wants to soak up that world and, you know, within it he tells a few stories and they're all running concurrently and they all kind of reach ahead and there's just so much poetry to it, it's just beautiful. I think also, like, you're, you're both right with the Westerns with that. you got to, like, almost picture yourself in the desert in the heat so you want to feel how exhausted the characters are and you want to feel like you're wearing the boots and, I don't know, so the much spurs. about... It. It's the believability, isn't <laughs> how it? How grizzled. <laughs> yeah. Because when you see those okay. Westerns that look a little bit too, you know, costume-bought, you feel it. You just don't... you like, ah, this doesn't... Stylized. Like yeah. There's such a sandbox nature to it all because everyone's out, you know, to get in for themselves and they can do what they want sort of thing, you know, and there's, they're trying to build a civilization, but there's always those that want to just take it for themselves, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think to touch on that as well is that because it's the West and there is, well, basically just dust everywhere, there's this ever element of um, impending doom or like nothingness Maybe not Doom, but there's definitely an element of just there's nothing. There is definitely the intent of impending Doom, in, special, in the, a lot of the best Westerns there are. I mean, um, in particular, you know, uh, again, going back to Once Upon a Time in the West, they're trying to build civilization. They're building a big train line going through, yeah. you know, to reach one town to another. So that's the building, that's the creation of America, really. But obviously it's all, you know, getting planned on getting thwarted and it's all built on blood. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And, and that's what it's going pointing to, really, is the bloody history of the the making of that place, you know? it's. Uh... I think you're completely right there. It is, like, it, it is the whole building of America, because it's before there was, like, government and stuff, so it is just about yeah. whoever gets shot first is, in, is you know, not in, in charge or dead or whatever, you know, it's just... Well, I think yeah. it's a lack of lawlessness, or lack of law, should I say, um, because you would have a sheriff, but, like... Could they never really always had control? Mm. If there was more no. than well, let's even just say if there was a group of or, or gang of um, you know, rogue or bandits, whatever, the the sheriff wouldn't really have any type of control over that. So there was this unruly, lawless way of life. Yeah, I think it's like because there's there's a differentiation between what actually happened in those particular times, like pioneer films and those kind of things, and the whole Western myth itself. Because, like, Westerns were, they were historical folklore for America. America being a relatively new country. Yeah, it's... it's a, yeah. It's, because if I'm, if I'm right, they used to bring, like, roadshows over to this country, telling the stories of the cowboys and building up that mythology of them being these hero figures. Yeah, well, this is it. They would trade that, you know. Because likewise, we'd have the likes of Oscar Wilde going over there, telling stories of his culture and our world mm. and his idea of the world, and, you know. And it's, and it's all very romanticized isn't it you know and you know the the native americans they were the, the savages <laughs> yeah, yeah. i mean i was brought upon the john uh, well i was brought upon i wasn't brought up enamored with them because uh to be honest with you i hated westerns growing up because my old man he loves the old john wayne westerns yeah. and i can't stand them you know they really do my sweden um it was always the native americans as uh savages you know yeah but don't get me wrong, the Rio Bravo was really good, and there was a couple of really good examples. But I just grew up really hating the westerns, and it all, and it took that one, you know, that one either the spaghetti western or one of the later more re revisionist westerns to really kind of grab me by the, 
you know, grab my attention. And that's when I realised how, you know, the Westerns made such great cinema, you know. And I, I think you're right. It though. took that one example to make me fall in love with the Western. Because mm. like you're right, the early Westerns, the John... Um, John Wayne and the John Ford kind of thing. Gary Cooper and all these guys. Yeah. yeah. It's borderline propaganda as well. Like for what, Yeah, absolutely uh, that, yeah. I mean that's where Dennis Copper got his start as well, doing these kind of westerns. He's one of the more all American westerns and uh, obviously he kind of spearheaded the counterculture uprising with um his involvement to uh, making Roger Corman films, who made the trip and then obviously he made Easy Rider, yeah, yeah. and then he ended up making a film called The Last Movie, which um, was what he wanted to make as the typically all American art house film. Because up until that point, he kept thinking the Americans, when they tried to make art house, they were borrowing hev- heavily from the the Europeans. So he mm-hmm. wanted to make his own art house film, and it's about him making a traditional Western, an all American Western, like the ones he used to star in, in Peru. But instead, he stays behind and kind of starts to get you know, kind of egomaniacal and the kind of tr- the, the, the natives go against him and then they start mimicking what he did on the film set by making cameras out of bamboo and stuff like that. <laughs> and it becomes a kind of meta Western in a way. And it's almost like he's totally just creating this um, subverted idea of his, his involvement as the American Western and just totally kind of like debasing it. And it's really, really crazy it's a really like a film well worth watching and it almost broke him because it was never seen for years and that's kind of where westerns went after that into this kind of subversive countercultural stance where they would address the fact that these films were propagandic and mm. instead the all-american dream was actually one based on decay and and savagery so well it's like um little big man you know the Dustin is it Dustin Hoffman film? Yeah, I've never seen that one, no. Yeah. It's a weird one. I mean he plays a Native American. If you can uh, get past that sort of thing or he's Imagine taking that on... <laughs> <laughs> But it does it looks at um, General Custer. And like General Custer's been used in the old forties and fifties in more of a propaganda way of being like the the right American soldier who did the, the right hero. thing. Yeah. Whereas later on in Little Big Man he's seen as being more of a coward abusive, not knowing how to use his power. And it really yeah. reflects nicely on, obviously, Vietnam and everything that was going on around then. And personally, I'm with you. I really love revisionist westerns because it, it gets them to look at American history, but it also gets to look at those tools that make that genre in itself. Oh, sure, yeah. And, you know, they didn't make it... They didn't even make it kind of like a stuffy education uh, lesson either because when you're looking at films like The Wild Bunch, you're just soaked in so much blood and you you really think wow <laughs> this is what it's all about <laughs> yeah. and obviously that introduces the notion of uh, bringing the kind of squibs that you'd see later on in films like Die Hard but back in the these westerns you know people yeah. are getting splattered all over the place did you really ever... bloody stuff and that's the truth of it all really <laughs> you ever seen um, Lonely Are the Brave no I've never seen that one no uh... See, that's an interesting revision of Western, because it's about like a cowboy who's living in, I think he's living in like the 60s. And essentially, it's him trying the to... The 1860s? No, 60s. Oh, okay. So it's one of like the last cowboys, and it's the, what the modern okay, like building yeah, like around Yeah, like neo-Western. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, the thing is, it is a neo-Western, but to me it's been more of a revisionist, because it is that yeah. old American way of life dying, which now, like, I think... I'd say it's, yeah, the, like the, uh, the dying of uh, way of life, yeah. Yeah, Ushering it, a new way. It's because I remember, like, I watched it because I had to study westerns and film studies, and I remember like watching that film. It has a very like sad ending because it was the end of those those ways and stuff. And it's it's a weird thing where, as well as like the obviously ideas of America and stuff, masculinity plays so strongly into all westerns. And I'm not saying like as in men in general, just the idea of masculinity of being strong and doing the right thing, and sometimes there's no yeah. other way and it's always been rooted within, like, Westerns. Well, everybody's dad loves the Western. They love John Wayne. John Wayne is the all, you know, he's 100% man, isn't he? And uh, the idea of him. And... But it, it never really does. Right, like, absolutely Clint right. Eastwood. Yeah. Yeah, Clint Eastwood again, yeah. I mean, he's stunned, you know. You, he's the governor. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, you'd have to run everything past him because he does it all. 
his way, the old way, <laughs> which is the best way, according to him. So you don't mess and, with him. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of my favourites that he made was High Plains Drifter because then that's again borrowing heavily from the spaghetti westerns, which is how he got his start. Mm. And um, but it starts creeping over into horror territory because he becomes a shape. It's almost like John Carpenter made the film because. Oh really. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, yeah. he gets revenge on this town who kind of who run him out and pretty much killed him. But it's never revealed if he is dead or not, which obviously gives it this almost supernatural vibe. And okay. he goes to paint the town red, but he just his his way the way he exacts revenge is that it's it's like a slasher movie. He just picks them up one by one, and it becomes this shape. Incredible. Interesting. <laughs> I have to check that out. Yeah, it's a High Plains Drifter. That's the one. It's. Uh, Incredible film for Clint. It's probably my favourite. See, the other Clint film that makes me think Western straight away is Unforgiven. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously that was the the big. This is the thing. This is what I find amazing is that um, every now and again, like the American the mainstream cinema will just roll out a Western <laughs> and it'll yeah. be big business. We or, were discussing this yeah. earlier. It's like you know, every few years it's like, oh, it's time for another Western. <laughs> <laughs> It's I mean, obviously Tarantino this time around, he made it less traditional, but at the same time, his love was all based in the traditional, like of all the types that he'd seen. And well, obviously he's putting his own Tarantino spin on things, but obviously before him, you had like Free Ten to Yuma remake and, True and uh, Jesse James, the coward Jesse James, stuff like that. This is, every few years, I just feel they need to roll out a new West. Kevin yeah. Costner always seemed to be releasing them now and again, and yeah, he seems to love that genre. <laughs> yeah, I think. When in doubt, release another Western. <laughs> it is interesting you say that, though, because we were talking about, like, obviously the more recent form of Westerns with um, neo-Westerns. And with when, yeah. when No Country for Old Men won the Oscar, and uh, There'll Be Bloods and those kind of films, it sort of brought back, like, it did bring back the interest in the studios just doing traditional Westerns as well. I think that's one of the reasons... Yeah, it yeah. happened all around the same grip. time. Yeah, yeah. You had the remake, like you said, Tom, of um, 310 to Yuma, uh, that's probably one of yeah. my favourite westerns. Um, and then you had like True Grit, which did really well. Um, yeah, True Grit was quite good. You know, I mean, Coen Brothers, it was kind of like dilute Coen Brothers, but it was still really enjoyable, wasn't it? Uh, but I think in more recent... Obviously, that will be blurred. You can class that as a western. It's obviously a much more sprawling, different, yeah. kind of different kind of story, but it's all based in uh, the rise of capitalism, isn't it? You know, and... and uh, Obviously, that's one of my favourite films. I think it's a modern classic. They'll all be blurred, and I think it's Same. just genius. I think I mean, in more recent times, um, there seems to be like a shift to the neo. Um, yeah. So, like the one that stands out for me, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, and it has um, the typical Western tropes to it, is Hell or High Water. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Do you remember that film? I don't think I've seen it. It's got Jeff Bridges in it, and I think is it Ben Foster? Yeah, Chris Pine. Yeah. Oh, you can you can always rely on Jeff Bridges. Yeah, That's I mean he's he's cut out for westerns. You know he's brilliant. He he does that similar thing that again is one of those old archetypes of westerns where it's the old man who's coming in to do the job and he's yeah. probably going to die at the end <laughs> of it. It's such a classic western thing or detective thing. Is any idea? And he's just got that but warm he's in... down the outlaws who have robbed yeah, yeah, the yeah. town and. Yeah, it, it's but it's all obviously modern, and um, set in modern times. But it's just a really simple story, you know. That out of luck, I think they're brothers, and then they decide to rob the bank, the town's bank, and it's a little small town, and um, obviously bigger than what you would consider a, a western town like back in the day. But um, yeah. they they kind of do rob the bank, and then it's just Jeff Bridges as the lawman of the town hunting them down. It's really interesting. I have to have a watch of that because you know when I get into a Western mood, you, you take take the really good Western to really kind of get you in the mood from again. Because, like I said, you know, I mean, I hated them for years, and it just took that one or two amazing Westerns to make me think, "Wow, what a genre this is!" You know. Yeah. Have and you, uh, growing up on all those pitiful uh, American ones <laughs> <laughs> from the fifties, and you know, it was just so oh, crikey. You know, I, I, I was enough to just, it was enough to put me off for life. But then the Italians, as usual, saved the day. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I'll, 
I, I can't recommend. I mean, there's so many spaghetti westerns that I can't recommend enough. I mean, one in particular is called um, Face to Face. Is the is the uh, English title, but it's called Fat Cheer and Fat Cheer, and it's got Thomas Mulian in it. And again, it's an allegory about the rise of fascism and totalitarianism, and nice. up against the counterculture. And when you watch it, you just your mind's blown at how good it is. You know, it's, just, it's the character, it's the characters, and it's, it's always the 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 outlaws or the you know the the thieves that end up being the good guys. <laughs> yeah, but that's one <laughs> thing. The, that the we're lawmen gonna... are the the lawmen are the villains, and this is usually kind of a staple of these revisionist westerns. Mm. That's is one... that the law are, are, are actually the you know the enemy? I was going to say, Tom, that that's one thing that we were actually going to um, bring up is the characters within westerns because I think I I I believe that. Within a Western, you always get your stereotypical characters. So you got either like the good guy, the bad guy, but there, there's that little bit of rough around the edges. Um, so one in particular that stands out for me, and me and Sam were talking about this earlier, is um, The Hateful Eight, where you have oh, yeah. Kurt Russell's character, who's a bounty hunter. So he's kind of seen as the protagonist because he's bringing in the outlaw or the bad guy. Um, but when they end up in the, the house altogether... Um, it's it's very much all the lines are blurred between the characters, so you're led to believe that someone's an antagonist, but actually they they kind of are all right, um, and I think that's very poignant in Western films is that you are led yeah. to believe that oh well he's the lawman so he must be good, but like you've quite rightly said is that oh they're often the bad guy because we're meant to follow the thieves and like we're kind of meant to like them and what are their morals are they good morals it, it's just interesting. This is it. I mean, like, in a lot of the Italian ones, you usually get um, a trio of men, and they're kind of up against each other, but at the same time, they've got this camaraderie at the same time, and they've got this banter going on through the film, so it's almost like they're, they're, they seem to be helping each other, but then they're against each other, but then you don't know if there's betrayal along the way, yes. and they're all out for themselves, ultimately. You usually get one guy roll in who's got who doesn't really say much, and he's out for vengeance, so it's personal for him. And then you've got this other guy who's out for himself who ends up kind of joining forces with this guy. And then you've got the baddie who they've both got a common interest in. But then once the baddie's out of the way, they might have um, something to play against each other. So there's so many kind of different, you know, um, goals for these characters. And sometimes the wires get crossed, which makes it really interesting for the dynamic shift. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because West, with Westerns in particular, it builds that idea of the posse. And you're right, there's always an archetype within that of different, they've all got different reasons and they all do get along. And it kind of leads weirdly to, because um, I was thinking of um, Dead Man, which is obviously a very strange and different kind of Western. And Yeah, it's a classed as an acid Western, that one. Yeah, but it, it brings like the humour. There's a weird sense of humour to some Westerns. Because you've got that whole... Oh, yeah, it's really silly. I mean, um, I've never actually been a fan of... I mean, I struggle with a lot of Jim Jarmusch, to be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> I love some of his films, but then when most of the time I'm really underwhelmed, and Dead Man was one of those films where... I think it was Jonathan Rosenbaum who actually... Uh, I think he coined um, the term Acid Western when reviewing Dead Man. Really? <clears throat> and then that caused a review of the you know, of the, the slew of the few acid westerns that were made through the ages. And obviously back in the early 70s, you had the run of um, head trip westerns or countercultural westerns uh, that you could really, like, file under that that name. And they all kind of, you know, there's heavy doses of surrealism involved and just yeah. this, this idea of experimental avant-garde to them are thrown into the mix. And, yeah, I'm thinking it was coined when reviewing Dead Man, so I think it, the term came later than the actual films. Much like the folk horror thing, really. I mean, the folk horror films were made in the early 70s, but the term itself didn't come along till years later when Pierce Haggard was describing the Blood on Satan's Claw as folk horror. So, again, it was like a sub-genre that didn't actually exist until someone, you know, retrospectively uh, kind of coined it. I think when it comes to like the acid westerns and the more subversively strange comedy westerns, it really plays on the bleakness of like just living out in the desert and there's nothing there. And almost the yeah, absurdism. Yeah, the American really. dream's in decay and it's just yeah. all... Society is a scary place, you know, and it's... 
See, that's why I loved about Dead Man, like because Dead Man played that nicely. Especially the, I remember one bit with um, Iggy Pop, and he's wearing a dress. Yeah. And it's just like they're they're like two people who clearly are stuck with each other because of their circumstances and have gone a little bit crazy, but they're almost that pioneers of like you said they would have had they would have thought they were going to live a life of riches, going for the gold, and instead you know there's this. It wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely that, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a film called Greaser's Palace, which I um, highly recommend. It's made by Robert Downey Jr.'s dad because he used to be a really incredibly fan, like fascinating indie filmmaker back in the day. Um, and <laughs> it's about this town of, uh, run by this uh, guy called Greaser who just kind of, you know, he, he, runs, uh, he runs it with fear and brutality and it's just, it's full of scumbags everywhere. And then this guy wearing like a, a pimp zoot suit just walks into town and he's got this kind of kind of afro and it's a purple suit and he just kind of just skips and dances into town and he ends up being this kind of Jesus figure <laughs> to mix things up a bit. And a lot of it is so abstract that it's really hard to kind of start unpacking it all, but <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's doing something, you know, and it's, uh, it's one that I can't really recommend enough because it is literally like the epitome of acid western. That's the thing, the genre does lead quite nicely to being a bit strange and surreal. It's just, it, I think a lot of it, as we said before, is the atmosphere. But again, the, the general environment, it just fits it to add a bit of strangeness out of what would have been... This is it. Like I think it's about having an enlightenment, a lot, an enlightened uh, view of life and how you want to live life. But the society is not going to let you do that. And all they want to do is run you to the ground or rape you and, and rob you and... And I think that's what the characters end up in conflict with in films like the Acid Westerns, really. Um, there's, a, there's a different way of doing things or a different way of looking at things, and the, the majority don't see that. And they just react with violence. That leads kind of nicely into talking about you as a Western director, doesn't it? Well, what were the things... Well, that... yeah, I mean, um, it's, I think it's just because you look back at the Acid Western and I realised you could probably count on one hand the amount there are. <laughs> and um, I just figured, well, if I'm going to make something, I want to make something that doesn't get done much and it'd be nice to actually just roll it out and see how we do with that, you know. And we're surrounded by a lot of sandstone where I live, so... <laughs> Utilise it. kind of... Yeah, too right. You're seeing, you're seeing the what we've got around us. I'm thinking, well, that looks like the Wild West in the kind of jokey way. But then, obviously, the filmmaker and me saying, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Were there like any particular things like that you wanted to check book off as far as putting in a western? Uh, any type of what? Sorry. You know, like if you had a checklist, not checkbook. If you I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, you're signing yeah. off. <laughs> yeah, if you had a checklist of things that you definitely wanted to make sure you featured in the Western, were there anything like that? Yeah, well, I wanted to kind of make it a chamber piece. So it, again, going back to the spaghetti Western, it had to be mood based, and I wanted to create atmosphere. So that was obviously on the checklist, and I didn't really want to get too convoluted with plot because a lot of westerns don't get too bogged down with plot. They just create situation and they run with it and sometimes it gets drawn out and whatnot so we've just got to set this character on a path somewhere and he's got to be doomed because you know i wanted to, he's got to be this archetypical gunslinger but obviously he's got to be flawed so we want to kind of debase him in that way and peel off uh, the layers of what he t thinks it takes to be a man which goes back to what we were saying about how masculine westerns are mm. so i wanted to deconstruct that a little and Obviously, you well, you wanted to get those sprawling landscapes in there, so that was on the checklist. It's all about landscapes, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, Hateful Eight are you know, more like a play set in one location, but obviously it starts with some beautiful landscapes. You've got to get some landscapes in there. You've got to create a sense of, you know, vastness, because it's a big sandbox, and these little dots in this sandbox are just fighting amongst themselves, you know. And, um, well... It's just, you've just got to kind of throw these together and, well, because we're, we're in the UK, we knew we weren't going to get away with having people believe we're in the you know, Wild West or in America. So I had to kind of put in a lot of signifiers 
So, obviously, the standoff, for instance, that's a very traditional, stereotypical kind of image type that you associate with Westerns. So, I wanted to put a couple of shots like that in there just to make sure that people understood that the imagery is kind of harking back to those classic Westerns whilst also trying to be a bit subversive. And obviously, the other main thing on the list would be the music. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's all about. It, again, it's much like opera. It's all driven by music, driven by score. You know, emotions are going to come out in the music. And again, you know, because it was so low budget, the music was the weapon that we had to kind of elevate it. <laughs> so the checklist really is a few signifiers, throw in a few kind of classic bits of imagery, and then subvert the rest. Landscapes and then just characters on a kind of death trip, really, who are doomed. It's all about being doomed for me. I mean... Looking, looking at the revisionist stuff and the the acid western stuff, it's all about being doomed. So it's got to be it's westerns. It's just, yeah, yeah. Do yeah too. Right? The character's yeah. got to be doomed. There's no happy ending. There's no kind of American dream on the horizon. It's all about being doomed. <laughs> <laughs> so that, those were the main things really that we wanted to convey. See, um, just I just wanted to roundly say about that. Like that does seem like a general theme of westerns. I think of uh, Australian westerns. They're bleak oh, yeah. as fuck. Yeah. They're so yeah. bleak. Like the proposition. <clears throat> Do you remember that? The film? proposition is brilliant. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That one. Yeah, Nick Cave wrote it. It's a it's it's a fantastic film, and it it puts uh, it just puts such a grim light on obviously uh, colonization and that brutality of revenge. And obviously, revenge is another thing that's always sort of hand in hand in all westerns. Yeah, totally. It's very Absolutely, biblical. that. Yeah. In some regards. I mean, Proposition's amazing. That's one that needs to be rewatched. watched actually. There's another good one as well, um, which Troma has for some reason. It's uh, Mad Dog Morgan with Dennis Hopper. I mean, Dennis Hopper made it in Australia because at the time, Hollywood or anywhere in America just would not hire him because he was so bombed out on drugs. <laughs> and it kind of killed his career with the last movie, which in itself is an acid western, but it's just a little bit more of a meta western than that. And... And that kind of finished his career in America for maybe more, maybe a decade. And so he had to find work elsewhere. And he just plays this Irish bandit who ends up kind of causing, you know, robbing people and hiding out in the outback. And he makes friends with um, an Aboriginal, you know, native. And at the same time, you've got the government on his case. And it is your classic kind of stand and deliver kind of, you know, tale of a bandit going against the system and then you know uh, they ultimately catch up with him and kill him but you know he, he doesn't go doesn't go out screaming he goes out shooting <laughs> sounds quite similar to an Australian one we watched not that long ago oh yeah the um, what was that one the Ned Kelly the Ned Kelly wasn't gang. it yeah I thought it was Ned Kelly gang yeah there was oh a... yeah I haven't seen that one is it good it is really good yeah it was, it's very like um I don't know, very, very stern and very serious and bleak, but it, but it worked well. Yeah. yeah, that's the kind of the vibe you get from the proposition, though, isn't it? It's just very doomed and very... But very uh, it's I suppose with the Ned Kelly one, with the Ned Kelly one, it, it kind of introduces um, the whole idea of whenever there was that change in reality that you know the corporations and stuff were coming in the law was starting to become a lot more unified and growing yeah, yeah. that if you did right. rebel you would be shut down straight away because they were not standing for any of that you, like bandits were hunted and um, outlaws were hunted in the mass so you kind of then become outnumbered and they went on the run for yeah it. he's basically another neck killer that mac dog morgan because he went through the system and he was beaten and battered and raped in prison yeah it does sound very that. similar and he saw lots of like, you know, um, kind of like, you know, peaceful kind of villages get kind of pillaged and raided, innocent people that he loved die. And then he just turned on the system, you know, turned on society. And I think that's an, it's the same you said for Ned Kelly, isn't it, really? Mm. It's interesting as well. Like, I'll check that out. Yeah, it's definitely, what was it, this year? Yeah, it was this year that it came out. Um, with a lot, like you said, with a lot of uh, westerns recently, there is definitely more of a respect towards natives, which is really nice because yeah. it was such a horrific kind of archetype of cowboys good, Indians bad. They're not actually called Indians, but we'll call them Indians because you know. 
Well, yeah. Kind of well, some of them would call them savages, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's inter- it's nice to see, especially with um, Australian Westerns, you always see some sort of respect towards Aborigines. And it's, it's, it's good to see that when you're looking back at history, we can always see that the minority was never the one who was the attacker. I think um, an interesting thing to bring up there is what the Coens did with their Buster Scruggs film, because... They still portray the natives how they did in back in the fifties in that film, but they're they're not they're not com- they're not you know they're making a comment on that at the same time, aren't they? Because yeah. you know you're looking at everyone in the film and they're all kind of a bunch of rude toot and shooting people who end up dead really, and it's all people killing each other. So it's almost like an absurd look on those classic westerns from the you know the heyday. That actually um that leads quite nicely into Bone Tomahawk. Because obviously, oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot of brutality in that film. That's mental. yeah. It's you know, it, it took a while to get there. I mean, I personally found that they could have cut some bits out, but I think for the low budget it was made on, I thought again. I the thing I love westerns is when genre mash comes into play, mm. and obviously the last act of that film, as you know, is very much like a cannibal film. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's like wow. Um, what are they doing there, you know? I mean... It kind of it goes into an element one? of horror. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a horror western, definitely. Like a slasher. I think my only I problem... Mean, with... I mean, have you looked at... Go on. Oh, no, you, you finish. Oh, sorry, I was just... Um, I, I, was, I haven't really looked at what people, uh, what he kind of wanted to say about um, the, the portrayal of this kind of, you know, hidden kind of tribe... And what that was all about in in relation to the the, the protagonists. I mean, well, that's there really I, are savages in this. <laughs> that's why I was going to say the one. My only problem with that film is that um, you know if you if you look underneath it, the politics, um, that particular guy Craig uh, Zayler, I know that he yeah. does quite right wing films. Well, not right wing, but he looks at those old types like Dragged Me to Hell. That uh, not Dragged Me to Hell, Dragged Across <laughs> dragged the. Con- in co- dragged- Drag through concrete or something like that? Yeah. So he makes those kind of characters, and when they played the Native Americans to be these brutal savages, it did make me feel a bit uneasy with how, you know, there's a certain Midwest right-wing America that does see anyone of that sort of background as being savages. Oh, there's a great demographic of American audience that will see it like that, for sure, yeah. And... um. But then it's also an irresistible setup for a horror film, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. I think that's what he does in particular. He knows it's going to hit that demographic, but it's also going to intrigue the other audience who are like, "Well, I love genre anyway. Let's see how it mashes up." Yeah, yeah. So um, oh, it's, sort of a, it's a film I need to watch again, actually. Yeah, I, Kurt Russell. I mean, the fact that he did such a low budget film as well, and obviously he had the facial hair from the hateful eight. I think the great move on Zayla's part to cast him in that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Tom, have you ever seen Tombstone? Yes, years and years and years ago. Again, that was, to be fair, that was one of the ones that I watched with my dad that I actually quite liked because, again, it fell into that later, later kind of Western, like, like Young Guns or something, you know, and I thought, well, there's a bit more going on in there. There's a bit more action and, and it has a good cast. And I remember really enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I love Val Kilmer in it. <laughs> yeah, see, Mark Kilby, yeah, he's a doc, isn't he? He's a doc, yeah. and uh, <laughs> but it's, 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 I don't really remember much about it, but I do remember enjoying it. It's quite funny, actually, because it came out um, in '93, a year before White Herb um, came out in '94, and they're effectively both about a, like a, apparently a real um, lawman back in the day. But it was really interesting that two different production companies had done the same story. From two different perspectives. Okay, that's yeah, that's a bit uh, that's bad, isn't it? That, that quite happens a lot when studios yeah. go up get go up ahead head to head with the same kind of film, isn't it? You know. Um, let's let's sum it up. Let's uh, should we talk about our favourite westerns? Mm. What would you uh, say your is your favourite western then, Ryan? Oh, I get to go first for once. <laughs> 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 um, <clears throat> so yeah, I, it's just throw up between. The three tend to humour the remake, and Tombstone. Really, I remember when I first saw Tombstone. It was probably the late noughties. I think I just moved over to Portsmouth, and I went through a phase of going to. We've basically got a like a, 
a game shop in the UK for anyone who's listening in, and from America called CEX and you can buy like secondhand DVDs. So I remember buying and going through a phase of getting loads of westerns and Tombstone just stood out for me. Like it, it's just a fascinating story about it's simple, like a sheriff who basically sorts out a town, decides to go west and quietly become rich. Um, so the riches of the West. And there's this group, like gang of people there called the Cowboys. And they're just causing havoc. So his brother, who who goes with him, decides to become sheriff. And then he just gets thrust back into all this again. And he's then got to take them all out. Um, yeah, and I, I was just... Some of the cinematography within it. The, the dialogue. Um, Val Kilmer's performance. That's when he was on point. Like as Doc Holiday, he was just fantastic, and back when he was quite likable, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and not doing really terrible films, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'd probably if I had to throw it up between Three Ten to Yuma and Tombstone, I spoke more about Tombstone, so I'll I'll go with that. Fair. See, for me, like um, I love Once Upon a Time West. I think it's absolutely amazing, but the film that makes me that I'm going to watch it more more often is probably Assassination of Jesse James. Cracking film. Uh-huh. It's just stunning. It's just such a beautifully shot film. And the way it looks at that idea of being a hero, the idea of being famous or or some sort of icon or something to look up to and then like bringing in that toxic fandom and where it could lead to. It just works perfectly. The music's amazing. Nick Cave does a beautiful thing with the score. Brad Pitt's brilliant in it. And... Um, What's his name? Casey Affleck. I just love it. I think there's one thing that's really poignant about the assassination of Jesse James is, in actual fact, he never really wanted to become famous. He just wanted to become rich. Yeah. And his fame came from the fear that the law had of him. Yeah. And that's why, like, people then started to idolize him. And you see that throughout the film, don't you? That people, are, oh yeah. Yeah, and he the whole Jesse James image pretty much as well as Billy the Kid and these kind of things led to the whole Western genre in itself, and I just think the film beautifully kind of deconstructs that. What about you, Tom? Well, um, obviously I've been harping on about it most of the chat, but Once Upon a Time in the West is just like you know <gasps> the own the own no. most grandiose <laughs> Western. It's just one of the most beautiful experiences ever on film. Uh, when it comes down to westerns, I just can't love it enough. Um, I love so many Italian spaghetti westerns. Though. I mean, the aforementioned Faccio, Faccio, and Lucio Fulci made some great westerns, you know, for the apocalypse and put it for the general, things like that. Um, but also, one for the acid western crowd, I have to go with El Topo because it springs, springboards as a, a western, but it ends up being just one of the most magical cinematic experiences I've ever seen and it just totally changed my life watching it you know so mm. it's a film about everything and I, I literally mean everything like <laughs> it's so far out uh, so El Topo really just is up there with my favourite films of all time so that has to go on top of the list and I suppose for I suppose you guess to call it western you know and There Will Be Blood is one of my favourite films so mm. I can't Amazing. I can't knock that one out of the list either because that one is just for me um a modern classic and there aren't many modern classics and I just I genuinely think that's a classic yeah true so so too many to mention <laughs> <laughs> if we were to mention them all we'd probably be here all night yeah exactly so yeah I thought I'd go one for one with the acid quest acid western crowd and one for the, the classic western crowd you know so probably a there good we thing go. though going for the acid western considering day of the stranger and stuff it's going to be Massive, well, massive influence on it. Um, yeah, and you know, there's, there's been a resurgence of it as late. You know, there's a lot of articles coming out about the acid western, so it's nice to give it the appraisal that it needs and for people to explore these strange little films. And you're effectively when in the forefront. Case, it's an epic film. <laughs> <laughs> and you're effectively at the forefront as well, Tom. But um, well, you know, I mean, it's a little footnote in the, the genre, but at least it's an addition to the genre. So, yeah, yeah. Or the subgenre, I should say. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Tom, just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. Um, you've been no, a pleasure really enjoyed as that, ever. You know, because it's not often I get to talk about the Western. Uh, it's not something I'd class as, you know, top genre in my eyes. But then when I do watch the films, you forget about 
how good they are. So it is a top genre. So it's nice to actually chat about it. Yeah. I think you summed it up perfectly there. <laughs> yeah, that's Westerns. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> just want to say thank you again, Tom, and um, we'll try and get you back on again sometime soon. Pleasure, guys. Always a pleasure. Speak soon, man. Bye. Yeah, nice one, guys. Take care. Bye. Yeah. So yeah, thank you guys for listening to this week's podcast. We hope you really enjoyed it. As ever, please leave a like, leave a comment. If you want to discuss your favourite westerns or if there's anything we missed, drop us a comment. And uh, as ever, please subscribe. We, um, We really appreciate the support. And go on to our website. We've got some new content going up there within the next week. That's www.trasharts.co.uk. But guys, appreciate you listening. Trash Arts take out. Bye-bye.